I looked out of the window and I saw an active volcano that we were flying over. It's a very famous one near Mexico City. And I looked out there and I remember just getting extremely excited and grabbing my wife and saying, look, look, that's an active volcano. And she goes, yeah, that's amazing. And I said, you know what would be amazing if I walked over an active volcano? Linda, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me on. Very excited to have you on. Obviously, in a very crazy world right now that we're going through, uh, both of us are secure in our hometown at the moment. But uh, I don't know how you feel in terms of just given all the crazy things that you do, how you've been able to react in a crazy time like this. Obviously, it's a different yeah. situation. You're kind of facing this silent devil that we're all going through. Yeah, look, I think that through experience in life, I have learned that every time that I've been in a valley or in a crazy situation, it's led to great things. So because I've been in that valley so many times, now I I can always look to the great things. I've just learned, it's just a habit, a learned trade, I believe. And something that I practice immensely is, is always focusing on the positive. So to me, look, live entertainment, which is my world, is shut down. Not so I a, have adjusted and made some some adjustments to be able to entertain even against, you know, the survivors that we're dealing with. Um, but I've also um, believe that the entertainment world is going to come back stronger than ever. I believe that people are starving for live entertainment. And I believe that when we do find either a, a cure or a, some sort of a medicine that can tame this thing, uh, I believe that entertainment will bounce back in a huge way and, and probably be stronger than it has been in the last 10 to 15 years. Yeah, I mean, for people like yourself, drive-in entertainment is is one way you've you've adjusted a few people that yeah. really want to entertain and people that really have that purpose. They always find a way to be able to get yeah. what they want, right? Yeah, real early on, I was writing a book and I was I was actually just about to write the last chapter and I was sitting at the dinner table with my wife and I looked at her and I was like, you know, what are we going to do next? And, and it was at the beginning of this virus, probably about three weeks into this, us being, you know, completely quarantined. And I said, uh, what are we going to do next? She's like, what do you mean? She's like, we can't do anything. I'm like, no, we can do something. Let's figure it out. <laughs> and uh, I said, what if we did a drive-in thrill show? And it, it, we ended up opening in Florida with this drive-in thrill show. We have a, a closed circuit radio station. So you tune in in your car, you can sit in the air conditioning if you want. And everything that we do is above the ground. Uh, I've involved a bunch of my incredible daredevil friends and, and, uh, it was kind of cool, actually a cool opportunity because generally the best of the best are headlining on different shows. We never get to perform together. So mm. when I picked up the phone and called the greatest human, human cannonball in history, he was like, heck yeah, let's do it. And I, I called some of the greatest FMX riders and, and these, these motorcycle stunt riders. And I'm like, what are you guys doing? And they're like, we're there. Whatever it takes, we're there. Uh, so it's really cool opportunity. It has been for us to spend a lot of time together. A lot of us that have like minds uh, to actually spend time together and bounce ideas off of each other. We've come up with like four different other world records we're going to break together now. Uh, just just cool opportunities have come wow. from this very – what you could see or foresee as a, a very negative situation. Again, I, I believe that something positive comes from everything negative. And, and to be honest, that's what my book is about as well. Yeah. So wait, what are those four records that you guys are looking to break? Have you guys announced that yet? So we haven't announced it yet, but okay. there, uh, there, there's some pretty cool records that we're going to do where we'll combine different stunts together to break some records. Well, it must be a hell of a show because you've got all of these top headliners that are just craving to entertain people and they've been out for so long and you bring all of them in one place and also people that yeah. are craving entertainment as well. You're kind of bringing all these guys into one area and just giving it their all. It must be a hell of a show. How has it been going so far? It is. It's been going really well. We've been selling out in the locations that we've been. We've actually stayed in Florida so far, but we do plan on branching out. I think we'll be heading up to uh, Michigan, and then uh, we're just playing the states right now. But Michigan, uh, we're going to go to, I believe, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Buffalo, uh, Chicago. So, uh, but yeah, so it's, but it's been a lot of fun just to, again, during this time where it's just all about negativity. I mean, our whole world is a mess right now. I mean, leave the sure. virus out of it. And it is, um, 
it's hard to stay positive in times like that. And, and it's good to surround yourself, which, which is something that I talk a lot about, but surround yourself with people that have like minds. Uh, but often that I try to surround myself with people that are better than me, uh, mm -hmm. at things so that it drives me to become better and, uh, and makes me stronger and makes me uh, more mentally sound and, and, and builds me up. Um, rather than surrounding myself with a bunch of minions that just do what I say and they, they want to be or train or whatever, I surround myself by people that, that, that drive me to be better. Sure, sure. I mean, I think that's why you, what you're doing now is so important just because people need to find some way to escape from the realities, at least for a moment, right? They want to be able to kind of just not think about the reality of what's happening in their day to days. Yeah. A lot of people are losing their jobs and for them to just be able to escape and to laugh and to be wowed by the things that you're doing for at least an hour or two, it's, uh, it's quite amazing. But uh, I want to dig into kind of the starting point and let me know, is this the correct way to describe the, is it tightrope walking? Is that the right yeah. nomenclature? Okay. Yeah. Simple yep. as that. So yep. how did how did this get started? I, I know you started at a very early age. Yeah. Uh, but I'd love to know kind of the whole story and, and dig into some of the, the, the family history behind this. Sure. So uh, in Bohemia, back in the 1780s, my family started walking on wires uh, and walked for uh, three generations since the 1780s and made their way over to Germany and Europe, uh, which is where my great-grandfather was born. And he was sort of a an innovator and creator and, and a lot like me, a visionary, and wanted to take the name further and do things bigger and higher and broader. And he created uh, what's known as a pyramid, a human pyramid on the wire, where they would either two guys would be standing on the wire and then somebody would stand on a bar between their shoulders or those two guys might be on bikes and the guy standing on the bar between their shoulders. And he was just, again, he just always thought outside of the box. And he created this amazing act with his uh, with his brothers and his uh, and, a, and a ballerina at the time, and they they did this these amazing feats. Eventually, got hired to go to Cuba and perform. They were performing in Havana, Cuba, in 1927, doing these these again world headline making uh, feats. And John Ringling, who was the founder of Ringling Brothers Circus, read these headlines and and heard he had to go see this act perform. So he got on a ship, went down to Cuba and saw my family perform for the first time. Well, attempted to. He went to a show where they were headlining. And that evening, my family was getting ready to perform. They were warming up and getting ready to get on the wire, stretching and had their costumes on already. And the show owner in Cuba came up to them and said, you know what? You guys have done such a great job. You filled the seats. You've packed our houses for the last two months. I'm going to give you the night off. And my family thought, what do you mean? The show's on. We're supposed to close the show. It's already intermission. How are we getting the night off? And uh, they, they thought something is up. Well, what they didn't realize, but the, the show owner did, was that John Ringling was in the in the audience. And the show owner did not want to see have John Ringling see my family perform because he knew if he saw them perform, he would immediately sign them to come to the United States to perform on Ringling Brothers. So a long story short, John Ringling was an astute, smart, brilliant businessman, and he knew what was going on. It probably happened to him in other shows in Europe and across the world uh, and in South America. And he basically snuck in the following night and saw my family perform. And he immediately found them, signed them to come to the United States. So their first performance in the United States was in 1928, where they uh, made their way over. The net that they used at the time was lost in shipping. And they made their way over here to the United States to perform in the old Madison Square Garden in New York City, which is wow. where they were going to open. And they set up the wire. And my great-grandfather always set up the wire as high as he could. Didn't matter how tall the building was, he put it as high as he could. So he set the wire up, and there was no net. Again, lost in lost in shipping. And my family thought, well, you know what? We're still going to perform. We will be fine. We're not going to use a net. Was that uh, the first time performing without a net? Yeah, I don't think it was their first time. They they had they had a history. In fact, my great grandfather had a an older brother that fell into a net and bounced out and was killed. So he always had the belief that a, a safety device was a false sense of security anyway. So he was sort of against it, but most shows required it at the time. So a long story short, he uh, John Ringling came into the arena before the show and looked up and saw the wire and said, Absolutely not. There's no way they can perform that high. He actually made them lower the wire before the audience came in for the first show. <laughs> so they lowered the wire down, first performance, packed out crowd, Madison Square Garden. They did this amazing routine of these incredible feats on the wire, all these crazy pyramids. And uh, they made their way down to the ground to take their final bow, and the audience went crazy. 
And uh, the audience was whistling, they were screaming, they were foot stomping, they were just, just blown away. But my family became frightened and they ran back to their dressing rooms because in Europe back in those days, whistling and foot stomping was the same as being booed off the stage. So they thought they were a bomb, that they were a failure in the United States, but little did they know they were a huge success. The ringmaster banged on the door, made him go back to the arena. And for their first performance in the United States, they received a 15 minute standing ovation. <laughs> so, uh, so that was their first time in the U S my great grandfather and family performed on Ringling for about 17 years straight and then branched out and said, you know what, I'm going to do some stuff on my own and started again, creating and innovating in 1947. He created the seven person pyramid on the wire, which they performed successfully until 1962. And in 1962, they were performing uh, at the State Fair Coliseum in Detroit, Michigan. And as they made their way out on the wire in that pyramid, the pyramid collapsed and two of my uncles were killed. Uh, one of my uncles was paralyzed from the waist down. My great grandfather had many injuries. Uh, but the next day, living by the words, the show must go, go on, which my family has for over 200 years, he actually snuck out of the hospital against the doctor's orders and got back on the wire and performed and went oh on to perform. God. Uh, against all odds, performed until he was 73 years old. Uh, he'd performed over baseball stadiums. He did seventh inning stretches. He did football games. He performed all over the world uh, headlining. And in 1978, uh, he was performing in San Juan, Puerto Rico. And he was on a show that they were headlining on a circus under a big top. And they weren't selling a lot of tickets. And he said, well, to the show owner, he goes, you know, I'm going to go rig a wire between two skyscrapers and I'm going to walk and it'll build a bunch of media and hype. And then we'll sell tickets to the show. And the show owner, of course, obliged. And my great grandfather had his crew at the time who was there set up his wire. Uh, unfortunately, they set up the wire improperly. It was not stabilized properly. And my great grandfather was 73 years old at the time. Uh, he started to walk out on that wire and realized the wire wasn't stable. And what we believe after doing, we did a study with the Discovery Channel and some geriatrics doctors that, that showed that at 73 years old, your heart is just not prepared to take the amount of adrenaline that he would be experiencing at that point because of the stress of that wire being unstable. So he did what he was taught, which was go down to the safety of that wire. But at that point, we believe he was going into cardiac arrest and he ended up losing his balance and falling to his death in 1978. And then a year later, that was uh, the year I was born. So 1979, about I was born uh, within a month of his birth date, actually, uh, and within a year of him losing his life. And uh, my mom was six months pregnant with me and still walking the wire. So been walking a wire longer than my feet have been on terra firma. But about 18 months is when I started walking on a wire and uh, started at a on a wire that was about two feet off the ground and would walk back and forth with my mom holding my hand. I saw my parents doing it, and in our family, a wire is like a playground in your backyard, and they enjoyed what they were doing, and they, I saw them doing that. And just like a child who grabs a hammer and tries to drive in a nail, I, because his dad has a hammer, I saw my parents on the wire, and I wanted to walk the wire. So it started about 18 months old. By the time I was four, I was pretty good at it. By the time I was 13, I finally had convinced my parents to allow me to walk the wire up high. Uh, I'd proven that I was, uh, had a sound enough mind that I respected the day, the danger and the risks of what I was doing. And, uh, my first performance on a wire was at 13 years old where I rode a bicycle on a wire. I, um, walked up one end without a balancing pole about 30 feet high and then, uh, held some pyramids with my family. So Jesus that was, Christ. that was my first performance at 13. And then, uh, my career has continually progressed since then. This is what I don't understand is, is when you're going through the first process, I understand maybe at, at the, at the, when you're 30 or 40 and you've done these a million times, you, you feel pretty comfortable at this point. But when you're first going on, you, you did your first performance on a bike going through this hard wire. How do you practice for something like that? So couple things very unique to my family is the fact that it is my life. In fact, my great grandfather said it best when he said life is on the wire and everything else is just waiting. That applies to everybody for our family. It's real though. So for me, it was life. It was normal. It was just what I did. Uh, also what I was, the way I was brought up and trained was when I was training on a wire, two feet off the ground, I would envision myself or visualize myself 30 feet off the ground. So I would be putting myself there mentally prior to ever going there. And then when I get up high and I'm on that wire, riding a bike per se, I would visualize myself in my backyard, two feet off the ground. 
And I would put myself back there mentally so that I was able to stay calm. And, and again, it was a learned trait, but it's something that I learned at such a young age that it became second nature to me until we had an accident a few years ago, which I'm sure we'll talk about in a bit. Yeah, we'll go into that. Um, but when you were going through, because uh, uh, originally I, I thought that your great grandfather was uh, was actually alive there to teach you and to give you kind of the, the, the guidelines of what it means to be a tightrope a walker. But it, it seems like you guys never got a chance to, to, to meet in person. Uh, obviously, there was a lot of wisdom that was passed through him that was Absolutely. taught to you. But who was the one that was really there to mentor you every step of the way from the age of two? It was my parents. It was my mom and dad. It was really my mom more than anything. My mom is the Walenda. My dad married into the family at 18 and uh, actually started at a circus school at in Sarasota, Florida, my current hometown. But uh, but really, it was my mom that that sort of had passed those those traits down to me. And and really, again, all that wisdom, like you said, from my great grandfather and his experience was just passed down from generation to generation to generation. Oh, my God. Um, I did see the, um, the, 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 the fall that, that your, um, great grandfather, Carl went through and it, it's, it seems insane how unstable it was. Um, and it, I, I guess I was curious to know, like, is there a reason why the videos itself are public? Uh, because uh, it's public footage. It's there, there's nothing you can do. If the media takes a video immediately, it's released. Uh, you know, in the case of the accident we had about three years ago, that video was, uh, confiscated by the sheriff's department. And when the sheriff's department takes something into their records, they have to release it to the media after 365 days. So it immediately is released. And with the following that our family has, the media follows that. And immediately when they know about it and it's released, they immediately jump on it. And and, uh, and again, it makes headlines around the world, which is what happened a few years ago uh, when that video was released. I mean, it's an insane footage. I mean, so I guess the police took it because they had to investigate for any potential... Correct. Uh, if there was any any foul play, if there was anything, uh, you know, rigging failure, anything like that is why they did that. Uh, and unfortunately, like I said, I'm extremely close with the sheriff, but there's nothing they can do by law. They have to release it after a year. If it was up to me, it would have been, you know, destroyed. Because yes. there's nothing really the positive that comes out of it, at least for our family on the mental side. Now, look, mm -hmm. we've we've built a career and a name and a brand on triumph and tragedy. Our, our family history, there's seven family members that have fallen and lost their lives. So the reality is that is part of our history and part of who we are. But as a person, as a being for us to watch that, it only uh, it only tears down our psyche rather than building it up. And and I believe that that there's nothing positive coming out of that. So therefore, I don't even want it to go. In fact, I've never watched that video before, even to this day, to this day. Wow. Is that the family kind of bond that you guys have with the entire world does not to watch that? Are you going to show yeah, I mean, your that's kids? That's um, it's not that it's necessarily a bond. It, it was something that we agreed upon as a team after that accident when we knew the video was 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 there mm -hmm. before it was released by the sheriff's department was, hey, look, this video is here. We sat down in a restaurant, some still in wheelchairs recovering and said, hey, are you you know, what do you want to do? Do you want to see this video or you want it to go away? And everybody agreed, look, we don't want to see it. There's nothing positive that'll come of it. So so I think, again, it's sort of a learned trait. But, um, you know, our minds are very, very powerful tools. Tools, and we can either pump positivity or negativity into them. And, and again, for someone like myself watching that video, there's nothing, it's, it only is a negative result. It only tears down my psyche. For sure. For sure. I mean, it's, it's crazy. The fact that you guys have overcame that incident, which we'll go into, uh, and, and being able to do all these crazy stunts. I mean, you've, you've done the tightrope walk over Times Square, uh, of course, with your sister, You've done uh, the one with the uh, Masai Volcano, uh, Niagara Falls. It just, it, it's insane the things that you guys have been able to do despite all of these adversities. Um, but there must be some, some strategy in terms of like how you guys decide where to go and perform. Is there a team behind that goes around and scouts out these different places? And how do you guys even figure out where to perform and how to place the wire and all of these logistics that are just insane to deal with. Yeah. So, so all of these start generally start with a dream of mine or a vision of mine. Uh, I will use the volcano as an example. Me and my wife were flying into Mexico city where I was speaking to uh, a, a corporation 
Um, and as we were on a plane flying in, I looked out of the window and I saw an active volcano that we were flying over. It's a very famous one near Mexico city. And I looked out there and I remember just getting extremely excited and grabbing my wife and saying, look, look, that's an active volcano. And she goes, yeah, that's amazing. And I said, you know, what would be amazing if I walked over an active volcano and she that's immediately crazy that sort that's of the first thing that comes to your mind. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the way my mind works. And she immediately rolls her eyes and sort of blows it off. And and then she kind of realizes who I am. And that when I say something, if I want it to happen, I'm going to make it happen. We'll talk about Niagara Falls and changing laws and all that as well. But but um, so that that came from a vision of me looking out a window and seeing a volcano. And then from that point, I think before we got out of the airport, I called my team and I was like, guys, here's what I want to do. Let's start researching. Let's start scouting. And at that point, it becomes a, a mission of mine to make it happen. So it's not only finding a volcano, but for me, it's the vision that I have. So there are a lot of volcanoes. Uh, there are a lot of calderas, I should say, that were volcanoes that have dried up, that are not full of lava, they're not active, etc. But when I visualize walking over a volcano, I visualize walking over 2,000 plus degree magma with gases that are so thick that you can't see, with it, or that are so strong they can eat through the cable and your skin. Um and, uh, and all the challenges that come a, a long spans, uh, et cetera. And, uh, so we started, my team started looking and researching and about, I don't know, about a month, two months later, and that was like five or six years ago. And I just walked this year over that volcano, but we nailed, narrowed it down to like five of them. And then we get on a plane as a team. There's, there's four or five of us that'll get on a plane and we'll fly to these places and we'll look. And we found one in Nicaragua that was just perfect. In my opinion, it was 1800 feet across. So the distance was, was good. It, I knew I'd be out there for about 30 to 45 minutes. It was about 1800 feet high. It had active lava below. It had heavy gases. It had winds. It had every challenge that I that I'd envisioned and visualized. Everything that would be a night uh, a nightmare for a wire walker is is to me that's that's the goal. That's the dream is to overcome these challenges. So, by the way, when most that, people go through and scout places, they look for safety measures. It, it seems like you <laughs> did the exact opposite. Yeah, I mean, look, being a daredevil and, and wanting to inspire people that nothing is impossible, it's hard to inspire somebody when you walk over a hole in the ground that used to be a volcano, you know? So so for me, if you're going to go, go big. If you're going to do it, do it right. It's just the way I live my life on and off the wire. Uh, it is a blessing and a curse, but the reality is that that is just who I am. So we find the location and then we look at it and figure out, okay, well, well, here's, you know, my engineer team will be like, okay, here's the easiest and best, safest place to go. And generally that's not my vision. So I'm like, you know, which is exactly what happened in the volcano. I'm like, okay, that's awesome, but that didn't work for me. So we need to try to do it here. And it creates a big challenge for them as well. But in the end, again, I've got the best team in the world that, that are amazing at what they do, that keep me safe, that make sure that wire is rigged properly and safely. And unlike my great grandfather's wire. Uh, so I know I don't have to worry about the wire itself. I can focus on my training and being ready mentally and physically to make it from one side to the other. And when you're going through these, this vision of going through this challenge and, and going and pushing yourself further, I mean, you're talking about, oh, like you want it to be higher. You want it to be a live volcano. You want it there to be wind, like literally to risk your life. I mean, wh where does the, where does the motivation come from? Is it, is it to because you know it's going to be publicized on live TV. Is is it going to be? Is it pushing yourself further to challenge it? Is it for yeah. your, for, for the legacy of your grandfather? Is it? Is so it I would say, yeah, I would say it's a little bit of each of those. It is certainly for the legacy of my great grandfather and my family history. But I am self motivated. There's something within me that dri I have a drive like nothing else. And again, if I set my eyes on something, I'm going to make it happen. I mean, even to the point that that. My wife, I've always thought when I was young, when we were younger, I've known my wife since she was born and I was two years old. But as we were teenagers, I used to look at her and be like, man, she's way out of my league. But I just in my mind went, you know what, that's the woman I want to marry and I'm going to do what I have to do to win her over. And, and make sure she falls in love with me. And that's just, that's just my drive. So, um, 
again, I visualize stuff and, and I just make it a reality. There's, I've, I've created products, et cetera, which I can't talk about uh, necessarily right now, but that I, I've got patents on where it's just my mind. And I'm like, no, I'm going to make this happen. And people will be like, oh, that doesn't work. Can't make sense. That makes sense. I'm like, nope, we're going to go for it. We're going to figure it out. It's just, again, the way my mind works, but I'm very self-motivated. You know, I'm in an industry where the reality is I have very little to no competition that have made it to where, in fact, no one in my industry has made it to the level that I'm at. And I don't say that arrogantly. I say that, um, uh, humbly, like it's a blessing. It's amazing that I've been able to get to where I am, but I have to drive myself to do more. I have to drive myself to go higher and go further because there isn't really a lot out there that's driving me other than mm -hmm. myself saying, you know, look, my bills are paid. I've been blessed. I am successful. I can retire today, but I continue to do this stuff. And, and, and I think another reason is I do what I do to inspire people. And how do you inspire people? If you stop, you know, you got to keep going. There will be a time, don't get me wrong. We're all retire uh, from this, but, but really I just have this drive to continue to, to inspire people that nothing is impossible. And, Look, it's it's all about setting our minds to a goal and, it, and and pursuing those goals. At a young age, I had a mentor that said, write down your goals every year on New Year's and then make sure that some of them are, are very easily achievable and make some, or some of them aren't achievable, but keep striving to do them and carry them on to the next year. Next year's add it back to your list. And, and that's really the way I've lived my life and done. I mean, bought my first house at 18 years old because of that. And it wasn't mm. as though I was making tons of money performing. In fact, I was working at a restaurant from 15 to 18 as a bus boy, but I just had this drive to, to continue to, uh, and still have this drive to push myself to be better, uh, and to continue to better those around me, which is always my goal. Well, what are some of those goals that you haven't been able to achieve yet with that you wrote mm -hmm. down at the age of 18? So at 18, I've achieved most of them. And in fact, I've written two books. I have, uh, I've broken 11 Guinness world records. I have, uh, several rental properties. Now I have, I'm just trying to think of, of the list back then, but the list changes every year. I mean, I'm, I'm now focusing my eyes on, on, uh, walking or doing an event, not necessarily a walk, but in outer space. Because again, it's something that is that is nearly impossible. And, and will I get there? I don't know, but I'll continue to strive. It gives me something to push for. It gives me something to work for. It gives me something to look forward to. So again, always reaching higher and higher. And, and in my world, it's very literal. But but even in the reality, the real world, if you will, I guess I do live in the real world. But but those that aren't daredevils necessarily or aren't, aren't risk takers, um, you know, just in everyday life, whether it be another investment or or creating something new or or you know, one of my other dreams is to reinvent the circus. The circus world was the greatest form of entertainment for hundreds of years. And then it sort of dwindled away. And my, my dream, my vision is to rejuvenate and reinvent that to where the next generation wants to go see a circus where they're inspired. The greatest athletes in the world are under a big top. You know, uh, you see, you see, uh, uh, hundreds of NFL players every Sunday, hundreds of NL, ML, major league baseball players, etc. You see very few people in the world do what we do. And they truly are the greatest athletes in the world that are, that are able to overcome the mental side as well as the physical side and do things that are, that are seemingly impossible to others. Yeah. I mean, it just, this just seems so out of my understanding of how your mind works. But I think one thing that's clear is that you have certainly a very high intrinsic level of motivation. I think Jeff Bezos says something around the idea where the competition is really just yourself because once you reach number one in your field, there's no one else to compete with afterwards. It's really just how do you get better internally every day and how do you continue to push yourself and innovate? And it, it seems like at this point in your career, the fact that you keep continuing to push and continue to push for innovation and do have, your, have crazier challenges uh, the fact that you're at the number one in this field, it, it has to be you. You're competing with yourself and you're competing with yeah. bettering the legacy that you've built for your family. Yeah, that's right. That is that is my drive. And, 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 and again, my whole goal is to always get to the mountaintop maybe quicker than anyone else, but be able to reach down and help the others up. 
And that's always been my goal. It's not just about me. It's not selfish. It's just, I have this drive. So how can I use this to elevate my entire industry? Look, my background is circus. How do I elevate? How do I use the gifts and talents that God has given me to elevate the entire industry so that others, all of my friends, all of my family, all of them can have a future. My mom wrote a book in the eighties called the last of the Walendas because she believed there was no future in our industry. She didn't think she didn't want me to carry this on. She pushed me away from the industry. In fact, at, at 18, I was accepted at a university where I was going to go off to, to, uh, eventually med school was my plan to become a pediatrician because I just, my, my family didn't believe that we could carry this on and, and, uh, and, and pay our bills and, and take care of our family. My great grandfather book wrote a book in the seventies. And in the book, he said in the circus world, one day you eat the chicken and the next day you eat the feathers. And that's the reality of, of our industry is, is it is a struggle. It is a challenge. So I, 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 realize that, hey, I think there is a future here. We just got to kind of change the way we're doing things and reinvent what we're doing. And that's what I've set out to do. It's not easy. It sucks. As I said, I worked in a restaurant for six years, all while pursuing this dream. You know, I can encourage others to step out of their comfort zone and pursue their dreams. I wrote this book, Facing Fear, to people in their job that are miserable every every Monday going to work, but they go because there's a check on Friday. And I encourage them, you know what? Step out of that comfort zone. Pursue your dreams. Don't give up on your dreams. Don't turn your back on your dreams. Continue to work, be smart, pay your bills, but continue to pursue your dreams because those that pursue their dreams and without, with passion, without giving up will achieve their dreams eventually, but they have to continue to push on. And those that give up are usually right on the cusp of success. They're right on the cusp of perceiving or or pursuing or achieving that dream. And that's when they give up. So I encourage people, look, use wisdom, but continue to pursue your dreams no matter what. That's right. That's right. And don't you think that it's surprising to me that uh, that your mom discouraged you? I mean, for the right reason. She loves you. She wants you to be safe, given the things that have happened in the family history. But uh, I'm wondering if there's a way to transfer some of those balance skills that you've been able to just naturally develop since, uh, since you were little into something like competing for the Olympics in gymnastics oh, or absolutely. something around those. Yeah, I mean, my, my book is very much about the power of the mind and, and all of those sports, they're, they're, the greatest athletes in the world will tell you it's a mind game more than it's a physical game. Mm-hmm. It is all in the power of the mind. And that's really what we practice when we get on that wire. In fact, when I walk up to the edge of an active volcano and the soil is loose beneath me, my heart races and I think this is unsafe. But when I walk up to that edge of the volcano and there's a wire in front of me that's been rigged by my team that I know is safe, my heart rate lowers because that is my comfort zone. That is where I'm supposed to be. That was what I was made to do. So as the greatest athletes in the world, again, they have to put their minds in the right state of mind. If you can put yourself playing in the back, playing football in the backyard with your buddies, not thinking about the 75,000 fans that are in the seats that are expecting you to carry your team that week, then you'll be able to carry that team. But if you think about all the pressure of 75,000 fans in the seats and millions at home watching for you to carry on the team, it will overtake you and it will debilitate you. And a lot of incredible athletes have ended their careers because their mind has won over matter. So what is going through your mind while you're 1500 feet up in the air, you're bouncing on this one inch wire and you've got lava basically waiting for you uh, underneath. And there's people that are millions of people watching you. I mean, what, what is going yeah. through your mind as you're going through that? So obviously it's a mixed bag of emotions, but, Mm -hmm. but I would tell you the large majority of it is I'm extremely thankful and appreciative for the opportunity. I, you know, when I'm in these places, no one in the world's ever been there before, whether it be over the Grand Canyon, 1500 feet up or over Niagara Falls or wherever else it is, I'm, I'm in a unique spot and I'm very appreciative for it. And, and I often like to take it all in. Now there are times where that wire is unstable or, you know, over the Grand Canyon, 43 mile an hour wind gusts without any safety device, 1500 feet, your mind wants to take over. But the reality is for the most part, it is, you know, I look at my life and I pinch myself because it's mm-hmm. surreal to me that, you know, I've had five major TV specials. I've broken TV rating records. I've had one Emmys. I've won. I've written two books. I've, I've done all these things. And, and I look back at my life and I'm, but I, I came, I'm just like anyone else. I don't, you know, I, I often say, why me? I'm thankful for it, but why me and why not someone else? And I think the reality is it's because of that drive. It's because of that stamina. It's because of that will. And I think so many people need that grit and that will. And if we could just reach down into our souls and re- and pull up a little bit more of that grit, a little more of that will, a little more of that drive, then we could achieve our greatest dreams as well. 
And uh, again, my hopes are by writing these books and by telling these stories is to inspire people so that they are able to muster up the courage to reach in and grab that a hold of that will and that grit because we all have it within us. It's just whether we tap it or access it or not. And all of that results in our mind and where our mind goes, where our, we allow our mind to go. And, and, and again, it's the simple concept, which my book Facing Fear is all about is – we can control our thoughts. Our thoughts are not in control of us. And it, it is that simple, but it's also that complex. Right. I mean, there must have been mental training that you do before that, because when you're there and you're trying to balance and if you fall, I mean, you die. Yeah. And you, I imagine you just can't let those doubts even entertain yeah, that's right. your you, mind. I would tell you a lot of that has to do with training and preparation. So when I'm, as I talked about earlier, when I'm training in the backyard, I'm visualizing the volcano. I spent a lot of time at the volcano prior to that, but I'm visualizing that. But not only that, I'll walk on a wire that is rigged less stable, so it's moving a lot more. It is, I'll walk in heat suits. I wa walked in a oxygen deprivation mask that reduced my oxygen by 70%. I walked with goggles that were completely fogged up. Uh, I walked with 40 pounds of weight on my front and my back, so 80 pounds of extra weight. I walked with on a wire that was not as long, but I walked it forward and back enough to where I walked five times the distance over that volcano with all of those instringents on me, right. with all of those restrictions on me. Therefore, when I get up to that position, when I get on stage to speak to those people, I've said this a thousand times, I can do it. When I get on that wire, I've done this five times further, hotter, less oxygen, uh, with my eyes closed, backwards. I can do it <laughs> once, forwards. Oh my God. And the crazy thing is you talking to these uh, hosts as you're going through this experience. I mean... I that's how comfortable you are in this setting is just you're able to have a conversation with these people and describe what you're going through as you're going through this. Yeah, I mean, and, and again, I think that just speaks to the fact that it is my life. This is just who I am and what I've done and, and what I do. So I've done it so long that to me, I can't imagine not walking the wire. You know, I can't imagine having a property right now in my, on my property, I have a wire that's 750 feet long. I've got one that's 30 feet long. I've got one that's two feet off the ground. I got one that's 25 feet. I can't imagine not having that. That's just my life. That's what yeah. I do. It's not, it's time to go practice. It is, Hey, let's go have some fun. And, and it's really true for me and, and my entire family. Now, some of us have had the, the blessing of being able to master our minds a little more than others. But but really, it is all a mind game. It's the power of the mind. If I know I can do it that well in the backyard, then I sure as hell can do it over a volcano. If I can do it with wind machines creating winds of 120 miles per hour, I can certainly face 43 mile per hour over sure. the Grand Canyon. Sure. And, uh, and often I have to tell myself that often, you know, over the Grand Canyon, for example, Jim Cantori, who's a buddy of mine, weatherman from the weather channel, he d he's at my events. And if he's not, he's always texting me what's going on and, and what I need to look out for prior to an event. And, uh, he'll say to my dad, who's always in my ear, Hey, that was 43 mile an hour wind gust. And my dad will say, Hey, that was 43 miles an hour. And my mind of course wants to go crazy and go, wow, you better go down and hold on to this wire. That's 43 mile an hour winds. But I can also go, but I've walked in 120 mile an hour winds. So that's mm -hmm. fine. It's okay. Now it's not always that calm. It is, holy crap, 43 mile an hour winds. And then my mind goes, yeah, but wait a second. You've walked in much stronger winds. You're going to be fine. And it is that conversation. Look, yeah. we all have seen the analogy of, of the devil and uh, angel on one shoulder, you know, talking back and forth. That's our minds. That's the mm -hmm. battle of the mind that we all deal with. I don't care who you are. On the wire, off the wire, at work, speaking, doesn't matter, walking down the street, walking into a room with a bunch of strangers, our minds tell us, you look like a loser, you're by yourself. Why do we look down and play on our phones? Because our minds are telling us that we should be uncomfortable. But the reality is, why would be we be uncomfortable? I don't look at the other people in the room and say, wow, look at him. He shouldn't be in the room, or he looks odd, or he's by himself. Or I don't. My mind doesn't work that way. So why does my mind think that everyone else does? Sure, sure. So, I mean, for you, it's really just comes down to preparation. I mean, you're doing three, five, ten x the level of difficulty, preparation, endurance, intensity that's required before for the actual obstacle itself. It's kind of like shooting ten thousand basketball shots to just make that one game beater, uh, buzz right. beater shots, just for but the. See yeah, yeah, but see, I practice that off the wire too. I practice that off the wire when I deal with a negative situation. I stop my mind in its tracks as it wants to go down the wrong path and will re, will will not allow it to. When I wake up in the morning in a bad mood, we all do sometimes. I don't know why. I can't explain it. I'll immediately pull out and read some positive quotes, and I'll read five or six of them, and then I'll force myself to smile. 
because I'm not going to get out of bed in a bad mood because it'll set my tone for the entire day. So therefore, we can all do that. We all have control over that, but we have to practice it. And it doesn't happen in a day. It didn't wasn't like I woke up a positive person. In fact, I'm probably more prone. I think we're all more prone to be negative than positive. But I continue to practice being positive no matter what, even when I don't want to, even when I'm mad, even when I'm in traffic, even when I'm frustrated. I'm in an argument with myself going, why would you waste energy going that direction? Don't even waste your time because you can't change it with your energy. So don't waste your energy. Use your energy on something positive, not something negative. So I practice that same sort of thing off the wire as I do on the wire. Then when a big situation comes, then when we have a horrible, tragic accident where my sister shouldn't live, I can rather than being in that gutter and saying, I'm going to give up, I'm done, I don't want to move on, I, 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 I don't want to do this anymore, I can go, nope. I'm not going to go down that route. Now, in my book, I talk about where I did go down that route way too far and why yeah. and how. Let's talk about that. Yeah, because I mean, the fact that you're able to maintain this positive vibe and to really have a system in place to be able to make sure that you're always spreading positivity and that you have that level of focus in your mind is insane because of the uh, kind of the insane absurdity of, of accidents that you've had to experience within your family. Uh, most people, they get run over by, uh, uh, you know, they get cut off by a car on traffic and their yeah. entire week is ruined. Yeah. Uh, but talk to us a little bit about what happened. I in used to be that guy. <laughs> yeah. So in, in 2017, we were training to break our own world record for the highest four level eight person pyramid on the wire. And a uh, long story short, we trained for six weeks. And we train down low. We start at two feet. We go up 10 feet. We go 15 feet. And then we go to full height. Full height for the record was 28 feet. It was two days before we were going to premiere this. So at that point, it's time to go up high and get all the mental uh, uh, get all the mental side out of the way. So we train hard, hard, hard. Do it 10 times down low. We'll go up high. So our minds go, we did it 10 times down there. We can do it one time up here. And uh, we went up high. And as we made our way out on that wire, the pyramid collapsed. And my worst nightmare became a reality where five of my family members fell to the ground, all of them over 30 feet above the ground. My sister's head was about 35 feet. My aunt was almost 50 feet above the ground. And uh, by the grace of God, I caught the wire. My cousin caught the wire. One other performer stayed standing, but five of them fell. And uh, my sister was injured severely. She broke every bone in her face. She was in a coma. She had internal bleeding, lacerated liver, uh, broken calcaneus, ankle, arm, mangled up bad. Didn't know if she was gonna live, in fact. And the following day, I did what I thought was right, which was get back on the horse. And uh, that's what I did. I got back on the wire and performed for the next four to six weeks straight with, with only a few days off. And what I didn't realize is when that accident happened, there was a seed planted in my head. And I often talk about seeds of fear and negativity or like a weed growing in your garden and or in, in your planting. And if you don't walk up, you see that weed and you don't walk up and pull it out immediately, it'll eventually – grow big. It'll take over your garden. It'll spread seeds, germinate, and it'll take over. Well, that's the same with these negative, negative thoughts in our mind. If we continue to feed the negativity, it just gets worse and makes us more miserable and gets us in a darker, darker, darker place where we feel like giving up on life if we continue to feed it. So what I've learned is to pluck that seed out. But what I didn't realize was there was a seed planted and I did what I thought was right, which was get back on the wire. And what, while getting back on the wire, it wasn't the right thing for me. In fact, I was burying that seed. And I just continued to perform and just look past it. And I got a strong mind. I'm not going to go there. But I buried it. And what happened was after a month, a month or so, we took some time off and I started watering that seed. And my mind started going, you fell. You failed. You're going to fall. You can't do this anymore. You're not going to make it. You're going to die. Your sister couldn't li might not live. You're not going to live. What about your kids? What about your family? Again, just feeding it, feeding it, feeding it to the point where we got back on the wire another month, six weeks later, we're training in New York City to, to do the seven person pyramid again for a contract that I signed prior to that accident. And I'm on the wire training and I watched that pyramid fall in front of me like it was happening at that moment. I'd hear a sound that I heard that day and I'd watch it fall right in front of me over and over and over again. Finally got to the point where I went back to my apartment and told my wife I was done. I was like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. She's like, what do you mean you can't do this anymore? So I'm done. I, I cannot walk the wire anymore. And I remember that conversation very well. And my wife said, look, I respect what you're saying. And I will honor whichever decision you make. But for 200 years, your family have lived by the show must go on. You sign all your autographs, never give up. You do what you do to encourage and inspire people. And you do, in fact, inspire people that nothing is impossible. They look up to you and you're going to give up. 
She said, I think you need to really reevaluate where you are mentally. What I didn't realize during that time was I'd become a different person. I was, I was a mean, I was bitter, I was short, I was, I was angry. Uh, I was not who I taught myself or what I, my family had taught me mentally to be or who I was to be. And, uh, and I, the reason why my wife can say stuff like that is my wife comes from seven generations of circus on one side, eight on the other, third oldest circus in Australia, incredible aerialist, daredevil, a couple Guinness world records of her own. She gets it. She understands. She has compassion, but she understands who we are and what we do and that we are overcomers, that we will overcome, overcome anything. And uh, it sort of set me into a whirlwind of, of, of having to reevaluate my life. And I'd forgotten what I trained my whole life. It's that easy to forget. It's that easy to train your whole life to do one thing and then you forget and you start going down that wrong path and you start believing the negative thoughts and start answering to it and, and agreeing with it and becoming one with that negativity and those thoughts of and those doubts and those fears. And, and that's what I'd done. And, uh, and, and in the book, I tell how, how I really had to, to a, I had to learn that I was dealing with fear because, because at that point I didn't even realize that I was scared. I didn't even know what fear was on the wire. I didn't think fear was in my DNA. So I had to learn what fear was, but then I had to deal with shame because it wasn't just me that was dealing with fear, but it was everybody around me that saw me dealing with fear that saw me physically trembling on the wire that went, wait, Nick will end scared. I thought he was fearless. I thought he was the inspiration. I thought he didn't give up. I thought he was over, could overcome anything. And he's shaking and he's trembling. So I had to deal with, then I had to go further back and deal with shame so that I could deal with the root of shame to deal with the root of fear so I could figure out what that fear was so that I could deal with it. But again, it was about going back and dealing with it. And I think so many people that deal with issues that turn to drugs and alcohol and anything else is because they have that root that they've buried. They've gotten back on the wire and they've just buried it and buried it and buried it. And it keeps coming up and they keep plucking it, but they're not getting all the roots. And then it grows back up. And those people just don't know where to turn. And that's why they turn to those things. But the reality is if we can control those weeds, if we can pull those weeds out, but the only way to do it is to go all the way down to the bottom of that root. And it's hard and it hurts and it's a struggle and it's not easy and it's a fight and it's a battle. But the reality is if we can do that, if we can go that deep down in there and get the entire root, that weed will never come back again. And what was your process of being able to, to do that? Were you seeking therapy? Was it just a lot of self-work that you were doing? What specifically yeah. was it that helped you overcome that? Yeah, it was, it was a little bit of everything. I mean, to be honest, getting back on the wire, even going through that, what I learned was you had to continue. You have to continue to walk through your fear. So many people do what I did and they stop in their tracks. I give up. I'm done. Not going to do it anymore. But what I had learned is I had to get back up and start walking through it. Even though I was scared, I had to get back on that wire. And I had to start self working on myself, working on that negativity, but also surrounding myself with people that could help coach me through that people that I could talk to. There was something extremely, um, healing, uh, about writing this book right here because it was me putting it all on paper. It was me getting it all out. It was me getting to the bottom of that root, digging all the way down there and pulling it out. So I encourage people, look, if you don't feel comfortable talking to a psychiatrist or a psychologist, if you don't have the finances to do it, if, if you don't have the means to do it, if, if you just don't want to do it, start writing it down, start writing it down. Cause there's something healing about just getting it out, get it out, then you can see it, then you can deal with it, and then it'll go away. But until you do that, it won't happen. And that's what I had to do. I had to talk to the right people. I had to surround myself with the right people. I had to get rid of some people in my life that weren't encouraging, that were tearing things up. I had to pull some weeds out that were surrounding me. Not easy. Sometimes that comes in the form of family. But the reality how, is how we need to be very family? smart. We need to be very smart in who we surround ourselves with. Well, you do it as graceful as you can, but the reality is you need to limit time with people in your family that are negative and that are not encouraging, they're not uplifting, uh, and, and encourage and uplift them from a distance, hoping that they'll eventually come to that point to, to, to come back around. But the reality is you have to do that. There are You cannot surround yourself with people that are not as good as you, that are negative, and I say good as you, I, I mean like as far as on the wire, I'm talking about that analogy. I can't surround myself with a bunch of wire walkers, uh, which is my family that aren't, aren't driving me to be better that are going, Oh, we'll get on the wire for five minutes today. That's good. I need people that are out there like three hours. I'm going, well, I better be out there for then because they're out there three. I need to surround myself people that again, with people that are, that are lifting me up. 
you can't become a better person or a smarter person if you don't read books, if you don't educate yourself, if you don't surround yourself with people that are more educated than you. You will become your surrounding. I raise my kids with that with that analogy of you can judge a man by his friends, and that's very, very true. Surround, I've continued, and you'll learn as your life progresses, your friends will change. I still love all my friends. I still spend time, but not as much with a lot of them because my life has changed, and I've had to sort of change my friends, and, and again, uh, not in a negative way. I still love them. I still spend time with them, but you'll, they'll just learn, look, I don't fit in with him because your life is progressing. And I have friends that's life, honestly, since high school have not progressed. They've just yeah. sort of stayed there, still love them, still go out with them. I'll take them out to dinner once, twice, three times a year, talk to them all the time, but it's not somebody that I'm with every single day. And those friends that I'm with every other day, every single day are sharpening the iron of who I am and I'm sharpening them and we are building each other up and together with the right team and the right group, just like my team on the wire, I know that we can do the impossible. And it's really about continuing to do that in your life. So, so often we come become complacent and it's so easy when you get to the point where I am, where Bezos is, where others are, where you can become complacent place and I've gotten there. No competition. What am I going to do? Man, there's something about me. I got to keep going. I got to keep pushing forward. And again, it's something that it's not necessarily what I feel every day. I don't wake up again, positive in the morning. Always. There are times I wake up miserable. I'm like, and I have to practice what I preach and I have to dig down and go, Nope, I have to dig down in there and go, no, I'm not going to go that route. I'll get an argument with my wife now. And, and instead of getting an argument, getting pissed off and, and why I'm mad and just dwelling on why I'm mad, I'll immediately make myself th think about the incredible times we've had over the last 20 years of marriage, because yeah. it'll immediately change my attitude. That argument, that fight, even if I'm right? What is it going to win by what, what do I win by being right? Really not much at all, unless it's ego, unless it's all about self. But I I've learned that it's so much, there's so much more power in helping others around you and building them up. And life is so much easier. It's so much smoother. Don't get me wrong. There's valleys. You fall off the wire. It happens, but get back up and it's easier. The more positive you are, the more times you fall, the easier it is to get back up. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. I don't want this. I don't want people to get the perception that this is, uh, you know, positivity, lovey dovey kind of vibe that we're trying to give out. The point is it's the purpose of this is, is not to feel, it's not to hide from the negativity. It's not to right. hide from the fear. Like the, this idea of someone being fearless, it's kind of ridiculous. Everyone feels yep. fear. Everyone feels right. negativity. You know, even, even yourself feel fear. It, the question yep. is how do you build a system? How do you build a procedure and the habits to overcome that and to and to flip that switch so that you don't feel right. that. And, and I will tell you, yeah. I was the first one to roll my, if I was on the other side of listening to this right now, 10 years ago, I'd have been rolling my eyes. That's so stupid. Think positive. Don't allow that to happen. Don't allow your mind to go there. That's, I was that person, 100%. I was the person that was like, that's such BS. That is not the way it works. But the reality is, as I learned to, to, to do that, and as I look back on my life, and the more that I did it, the easier things be easier the trials became, the easier the valleys were, were to go through, the mud didn't get quite as thick, that sort of thing. I realized that it was because I was starting to kind of not allow my mind to go those places. I was starting to control where I'd allow my mind to go. It's still going to try to go there. It is something that I will practice my entire life. It's like a marriage. You could have the greatest marriage in the world. You're going to get in arguments. There's good. There's no two perfect people. There's no perfect match. It has to. It takes two partners that are willing to work hard and fight. That's what it's about. And and the reality is, uh, you know, again, a marriage can 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 fail quickly because of of uh, where we allow our minds, where where what we focus on, selfishness, that sort of thing. And I encourage people: don't be selfish. If if we there's so much, and I think everybody experiencing this. I don't know, maybe not, but I love giving gifts mm. way more than receiving. In fact, it is almost embarrassing for me to get a gift. That's just the way I am. I love giving stuff to people. It's just something I enjoy. Well, well, that's the same. We can spread joy. We can spread positivity. We can be the one that's reaching down. And then when we are the one reaching down, eventually we're going to, we're going to fall back down there and someone else is going to reach down because we were able to help them. And, and I think the world would be such a better place if we could just live that way. If we could realize to accept people for who they are, realize that we're all mess screw ups. We're all failures. We all make mistakes, but 
because of that, we're all on a level playing field. So let's all help each other out. Let's all, you know, unfortunately the world, and I think, I think social media has led to a lot of that too. And, and just the way our world has gone, but has gone to a place where it is all about fighting and bickering and I, my way's right. And it's not, and, and you're wrong and I'm right, etc. cetera. And man, I, even when it comes to media, I'll watch CNN as much as Fox, if that's a good anal- analogy. Sure. It, it doesn't matter. I want to know both sides. I want to have a level playing field. I don't want to be fed what I want to hear all the time. I want to know the truth of what's going on in the world around me. Absolutely. Yeah. And especially in the world of algorithms and social media where you're going to get fed information the more you listen to it. You, what happens is most people love, end up living in a bubble and they don't that's actually right. know yeah. the other perspective. And this is kind of the divide that we have in the U.S. right now, and many places around the world is 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 because of that. And and I think that's yeah. that's why it's so important to go back to your point is like to to surround yourself with people that are going to help you grow, like people that have that growth mindset. Because a lot of people have, and you describe this in the book, is is this idea of like unhealthy fear. Yeah, I'd love to go into this a little bit because I think the idea of fear is is helpful, of course, and it's healthy because. A lot of the times back in our days when we were living the tribe days, you know, it helped us survive when the lion sure. comes or when beasts yeah, come, look, it was a way to run. But, you know, nowadays will, uh, it's psychological. There is a healthy fear and an unhealthy fear. And, and, and for me, that healthy fear is when I get to the edge of a wire, my mind goes, hey, this is dangerous. Be careful. Don't be foolish. Don't be arrogant. Don't be negligent. You've trained and prepared for this. Don't forget what you've trained for. Um, there's the unhealthy fear that says, don't do it. There's the unhealthy fear that the person who is, who is miserable at work every Monday and, and that unhealthy fear is that unhealthy fear of don't go pursue your dreams because you're never going to achieve them. Just give up on them and settle for status quo. Uh, there is a healthy fear. When I walk up to a rattlesnake, I am not scared of when I see one, I don't walk up to one, but if I see one walking down a trail that there's, there's a healthy fear that says, Hey, stay back keep a safe distance. Don't get near that, that snake. It could kill you. But there's, there's an unhealthy fear, which is turn around and run. Now, maybe not in the sense of a snake, but let's say you encounter a bear or a, or a a cougar in the woods or whatever. Their, their nature is you freak out. They're going to attack immediately. They're going to pounce you. You turn around, you run, they're going to eat you. If you say, Hey, I respect you, but I respect you. I'm going to stop in my tracks, but I'm going to stand my ground. Nine times out of 10, those wild animals will turn around and leave because you've shown authority. You've respected it. So again, there's an, a healthy fear that, uh, that, that also can drive us. In fact, I mean, I have, I have a fear of, of, of not being the greatest on the wire. I have a fear of not being the best in my industry. I have a fear that drives me as well. So that's a healthy fear mm-hmm. because that's what drives me. The unhealthy would be, you're never going to be the best. So don't even try to be the best. And that's what so many people have. And that really is status quo. I love it. I love it. Well, Nick, thank you so much for making the time to come. I highly encourage everyone to check out his book, Facing Fear. It has some of the most fascinating stories of what Nick has gone through and what his family has gone through. And more importantly, like the practical advice of how to train your mindset and how to overcome fear. And we, we just talked about the healthy versus unhealthy, but it really goes deep into that in the book itself. So I highly encourage people to check out and learn more about the Wilderness family and the history of it. It's fascinating information. So Nick, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, is there anything that you want to share or where people can find you online? Is there anything coming sure. up? Yeah, yeah, you can purchase my book at any online retailer, Amazon, of course, or nickwalenda.com, where I'll send you an autograph copy. Uh, and you can also find out information on what I have going on in my life, what's next uh, in my world at nickwalenda.com. So thanks again, guys. I appreciate it. Beautiful. So, guys, thanks for tuning in.